Okay. I'm Jacob, and once again, I have the very informative, independent scholar and good friend Sophia here with me. Sophia, thank you so much for coming back to me. I always love these topics so much, and I really appreciate it. So, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Um, hey, thank you for having me. <laughs> so, what is, the, what is the topic that we're going to talk about today? The topic for today is homosexuality and religion part one. But Sophia, <laughs> but Sophia, hold on. Why would it go on so long? We know that homosexuality is a product of this postmodern fallen society. Are you saying that it has a history? I would have a very rich and storied history. <laughs> uh, and I'm only going to be focusing on uh, the Abrahamic faith right now. Okay, well, so, let's take it to the beginning of the story. What, was Adam a homosexual? Uh, we don't know. The, the Israelite religion, which is separate from what we know today as Judaism in a lot of ways. The pre-Second Temple, or it's called the Second Temple, we don't know if there was the first. <laughs> uh, but, uh, the pre-Second Temple era, and it's not identical to the religion that we know today as Judaism. There is a faith playlist on my YouTube channel. Uh, you could use the finger box, F-I-N-G-E-R-B-O-X-E-S. And on that channel, um, there's a safe playlist, and it's called Old Testament History or something like that. If you want to like a general review instead of the big history, then that is a very good playlist. It's about 25 hours of material. <laughs> they were at best monotheistic in the sense that they worshipped only one God. That they didn't believe that the universe was monotheistic. They believed that there were other gods. They just didn't worship them themselves. Isn't the word for that like henotheism? I'm not really sure. Okay. But, but, I think that's what it but, is. But, uh, but yeah, and a lot of people don't know that, that at that point, really, before Christianity, it wasn't so much... I mean, Christianity really changed the course of the Abrahamic religions in the sense that, at least in the Orthodox Christianity, it really became important what you believed. Not so much as important as to what rituals you did. Before Christianity, it wasn't really so much an issue of what you believed. I mean, to be honest, people looked at it as... Why would the gods care what I believe? They exist whether I, I believe in them or not. It was about whose god are you allying with? Whose god are you sacrificing to? Yeah, and that's really um, an issue that I talk about is how the destruction of the temple in, in particular affected the evolution of Christianity, but it also affected the evolution of Judaism as well. Because, um, like you said, Judaism also went from being very focused on action to being focused on beliefs. Um, it just did it in a different way. The Israelite religion worshipped one of the Canaanite gods, and so the books attributed to Moses with their harsh treatment of the gods and the people of Canaan uh, come much later in the history of the Israelite people. The Israelite texts don't they didn't care much about homosexuality, but they were these texts talk about male temple prostitutes as well as female temple prostitutes. <laughs> Sophia, so, look. Somebody could very well say this at this point. I think many American Christians and many American Jews as well would say, hold on, okay? We know that the Israelites or the Hebrews, you know, these people who are in this area, the people of Abraham, we know that they were God's chosen people, according to their, their own mythology. Why would these people have sex workers at their temples? That is an excellent question. <laughs> and I'm not really sure that there is an answer that could be given that would explain that both theologically and historically. I think that the historical answer is probably that their religion was not fundamentally very different from the Canaanite religion of the nations that surrounded them. They weren't just female prostitutes at these temples, but also male prostitutes. What do we know about yes. these male temple prostitutes? Most of their clients 
It's not all of their clients will probably be men. It was a form of sanctioned homosexuality. And it's perfectly acceptable culturally, and the texts don't say anything particularly bad about it. And then by the time the texts of the Torah were compiled, uh, this was around the time of Cyrus the Great. Cyrus offered something new, trying to unite a larger kingdom than it had been done before. And his approach was a level of self-recognition for ancient religion. He allowed the, the religious practices and the religious rulers a level of autonomy that they hadn't had before. So around this time, the compilation of what are now the core Jewish texts either amazingly coincided <laughs> or it was a, they were written as a direct response to Cyrus. The immense role that Cyrus played is really reflected in the literature. For example, in the book of Isaiah, Cyrus is described as being the Lord's anointed, which is the word that we know today as the Messiah. So within the Jewish text, the only person who is mentioned by name as the Messiah is Cyrus. And it's very interesting how Zoroastrianism affected the Jewish text. The Zoroastrian text say on the topic of homosexuality, the man that lies with mankind as man lies with womankind, or as woman lies with mankind, that man is a Deva, a demon. This man is a worshiper of the Devas and a male paramour of the Deva. And that pretty clearly had an effect on Torah writers. Uh, for example, in Leviticus 18, verse 22, it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination. And in Leviticus 20, 13, it says, If a man lie with mankind as with womankind, both of them have committed abomination, it shall surely be put to death, but yet shall be upon them. And so it's very interesting that the Zoroastrian line, the man that lies with mankind as man lies with womankind, appears in all the Torah's condemnations of homosexuality. The next text to be written in the Abrahamic tradition were the Talmud and the Christian text, and they were completed or canonized later, and they were vastly in opposition to each other on a lot of issues. But they were kind of written, they kind of involved in response to each other. Genesis 19, verses 4 to 8, the story of Song of Gomorrah, and Judges 19, verses 22 to 24. Um, both these stories are brought out by modern Christians as examples of God's moral code. And that's an interesting claim because the story of the story of Song of Gomorrah is God deciding that raping guys is horrible, but raping women is okay. And he used Lot, who offered his virgin daughters to this rape mob, as the only person just enough to be saved from destruction. The second story, the story of the best concubine, has the same setup. Guy goes to a town, people surround the door, and the man to rape him, he gives them a woman. Uh, in this case, it's the Levite's concubine, and they rape her to death, and then the Levite chops up her body and sends it. He chops it into 12 pieces and set his gun piece each of the tribes, and they all come, they're outraged by this action, and they kill the people of the Benjamite town where this occurred, and the entire Benjamite tribe, using either story <laughs> as an example of God's moral code, is a little bit questionable. <laughs> Why do you think that Christians use this story of Sodom and Gomorrah as a moral prohibition against what later came to be known as sodomy? Probably because there's so little else. But there is so little else on the topic of homosexuality. Like I said earlier, in, in the earliest text, it doesn't seem to be an issue at all. And it's only the later we get, the more it becomes a moral issue. Is this before the Christian era, the shift from God being bigger and bigger and bigger and more powerful? Yes, around the time of... Persian Empire to the fall of the Persian Empire. Okay, so, so does it have to do with Hellenistic um, culture, do you think, as, you know, the Jews wanted to, 
keep their discrete cultural practices, and so they exaggerated them against the homosexuality sanction in Greeks? Yes, this, this does come into cults that was known to them because they were being ruled by the Greeks. But the first century CE was a time of huge upheaval for Judaism, with the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD by the Romans. And this led to a huge crisis of faith for a lot of people. And the primary issue was that the religion was focused on ritual, um, with ritual purity, sacrifice, with organized, structured worship to threaten, really, with erasure from history. And in a strange way, you know, we gave Judaism something to, to rally around and something to disagree with and to set itself up in opposition to. When we're talking about after the destruction of the Second Temple and the crisis of faith within Judaism, as it had to decentralize and find like a way forward after the temple was destroyed, um, Acharya asks in her in her book, one of my favorite books, The Christ Conspiracy, and in some other books I've read, almost present Christianity as well as as one of those way forwards for du- Judaism, as it could have been potentially a like messianic, um, apocalyptic sect, while. Um, while Jesus was said to have lived at, you know, like, be born at, like, zero and died at, like, 30 or whatever, um, it was really within that first hundred years where Christianity started to be codified and where the legend was was kind of, like, um, uh, spread around the area. Do you think that Christianity could have picked up steam in that area because it was attractive to Jews who would have wanted a Messiah and really could have believed that the world was about to end as Jesus did preach? That's a, big, um, a big part of the growth of Christianity. Um, but I, I think these two movements really fed each other because they were both, in a way, a sort of growth out of this crisis that so many people were having where they, they didn't know what to do. Now that the temple is gone, and a lot of people felt that this was a punishment uh, from God for their sin. So this became a very theologically important time for Judaism. A lot of people's responses went a lot of different ways, and one of those ways coalesced into Christianity, and the other kind of coalesced into Judaism. I think that it is very apt to see both post-Second Temple Judaism and Christianity as the ways forward in which different people went. This is another short playlist on my channel if if people are interested in learning more about it. Did anything we would recognize as a Gnostic view of homosexuality ever express itself? Uh, Not within the Jewish tradition, but it did within the Christian tradition. The post-Temple Jewish text that is the most important theologically is the Talmud. These are the two books from which most modern observant Jews draw their daily routine, usually one or the other, not both, based on their heritage, where they're from. In Rambam's list of prohibitions, he does include homosexuality, uh, but the Shulchan Aruch doesn't. The view of homosexuality of the Jewish sages at the time uh, of the Talmud, this has been largely influenced by the predominantly Roman culture in which they exist. So, for example, they say that homosexuality debases the dignity of man, which is a very Roman idea. It doesn't appear in any of the earlier Jewish texts. So fundamentalists, whether Christian or Jew, would say that God prohibited these activities, not Jews adapting practices from the much-hated Roman culture. So are you saying that there is little precedent for the Talmudic view of homosexuality? Within the, the Torah and the Tanakh, uh, the other parts of the Tanakh, there is nothing about homosexual sex being uh, one man dominating another. Within the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the story of the Levite's concubine, um, one could take that interpretation from it, but that is a stretch because in both these stories, the people were perfectly happy to 
to have sex with women instead of men. So you, you could interpret that in a way that the, the point was to, to dominate or to debase, but that doesn't seem to be what the text themselves say. So really, it, it was this infusion of um, Roman imperial culture and cultural mores that really influenced the rabbinical Jewish view of homosexual acts. The second problem that the Jewish sages have with homosexual sex was that it was very a seed in vain. And the theory behind this is basically that seminal emissions are a limited resource and they're related to strength, to vitality, and that releasing them weakens you. There is spilling of seed in Genesis by Oman from which this phrase comes, doesn't have this connotation exactly. In the story of Oman, the reason that Oman rejects away from the floor is that he doesn't want to have a child by Tamar because that child would not be his legal heir. It would be the legal heir of his older brother heir who was dead. He was trying to protect his financial interests. By failing to inseminate Tamar, Oman was trying to make it that he would be the main inheritor of his father's estate instead of his child by Tamar. It is his greed and his desire to take his brother's money. This is the reason why God is angry with him and kills him. So that's another kind of misplaced metaphor that over the years Christians, theologians would kind of use as weapons um, to prohibit sexual behaviors. Yeah, it really is. It's a very misplaced understanding of the story of Oman. The third issue that the Talmudic sages had with homosexual acts was that it would lead you to the very field of life <laughs> so that you could have more gay sex. And it's kind of uh, that kind of sounds like a modern objection yeah. that gay marriage will destroy the sanctity of marriage. Yeah, not, but it uh, only but that that objection not, w- may make sense in, like, a conception of sexuality that is pre-sexual orientation or pre-1800s. Maybe in a society that's influenced by kind of Greek misogyny, that women are an inferior version of man, maybe the thinking was going that men would not want to be with women because they're so awful, except for producing children, that they would much rather kind of be able to cavort with their own kind sexually, which would be socially irresponsible. Yes, and that does bring up an important point, that in that time, it was very difficult and very dangerous to have a child. And child mortality and infant mortality were so high that statistically any woman who reached the age of 14 had to have five pregnancies within her lifetime. Otherwise, the population would have been in perpetual decline. And it also kind of allows us to see, to use modern terminology, how much women were socially encouraged to act as baby factories yeah. during those times. And kind of they had to be. Otherwise, the race would likely have gone extinct. You know, that's not to say that it's good, mm-hmm. but it's understandable. And that's kind of why Christian asceticism and Christian monasticism was such a big threat to the yes. state. If the population went into decline, it would really affect society in a very negative way. And especially in a military state like the late Roman Empire, which, you know, during those first few centuries of the Common Era was trying to expand um, to new lands, and of course they needed an army. But if women and men, if men were to forego marriage for monastic movements or women were to go off in their own devotional activities away from family life, then that would be threatening to the state. But of course, it was only threatening to the state as long as the state could not harness the power of these cultic movements for itself. Um, which, as maybe we'll see in the next um, piece of this when you present next time, of course, in give it a little time, and the Roman, Roman Empire was able to harness Christianity for its own motives. Yes, it was. It was able to do that very successfully. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. I can co-sign that. 
So just before I wrap up, I feel like I need to comment on those theism in Jewish law. In terms of lesbianism in Jewish life, there isn't much to say. The scriptures don't talk about it at all. There is nothing in the Tanakh about lesbianism or about women having sex with women. It doesn't seem to be a thing that occurred to people. The Talmud suggests that it is an abhorrent act of the Egyptians, but I have no idea where they got that from. Really? I have that no idea. <laughs> yeah. uh, but what? I have no idea where they got that from. Uh, okay. They may have been using Egyptians as a stand-in for Romans. Uh, because it would be just too dangerous to, to say to Romans, you think? Every time they hated their rulers, yeah. they would call them Egyptians. It does discuss that scissoring is a crime. Do you think that the dearth of information or prohibitions, um, at least until a later period when it becomes you know, labeled Egyptian for whatever reason for lesbianism was because men, maybe theologians probably as well, just didn't see female sexual agency as really existing independently? That is probably an issue, but scissory seems to be the only kind of lesbian sex act that the authors could conceive of, so other than that, there's, that that's really all there is to say, nothing else shows up in the Jewish text until around the last hundred years or so. Their social and uh, political climate has definitely changed a lot. <laughs> that is really telling, though, that up until a very, very, I mean, comparatively recent period, that women engaging in any lesbian act that's not scissoring, which is, I mean, in actuality, it doesn't seem to be that um, popular of a an act among same-sex relationship women today, as much as some other ones are. But, um, you know, the men writing these texts clearly didn't have a lot of experience with seeing um, women I engaging in, in sex with each other. But that is the only thing that they could think of. Well, thank you so much for this. Is there anything else you wanted to add? See you next time. Um, how can uh, listeners reach you on social media or see your channel or things like that? Can you give us those links? Um, yeah. My YouTube, as I mentioned earlier, is YouTube user finger boxes, S I N G E R B O X E S. And there will be links there to contact me. And so far, I've only set up a Twitter. I'll probably set up some other stuff in the future. Okay. You'll see. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, this was very interesting. I mean, there's really not an overflowing ancient literature, at least from the Abrahamic sources on homosexuality, but looking at what we have that what little we have that does mention male homosexuality, such a small the small portion of the texts that are even considering female sexuality at all. That's been really difficult for people, historians who are trying to construct a, a lesbian history, because so much of history doesn't even seem to report that kind of activity. Perhaps because women were so rarely able to be in positions of writing their own stories or writing their own narratives or works. Yeah. And also, because of this, this kind of social need to control female sexuality and regulate it so that the population didn't go into the common. Yeah, I mean, especially in traditional Hellenistic and Greek culture, women were kind of just allowed in the home sphere, and it seems at least, from a modern perspective, that they had very limited lives and very little ability to pursue independent relationships. Well, thank you so much again, Sophia. That was Sophia, a good friend of mine, taking us through the history of homosexuality and Abrahamic religions, part one. Um, I'm sure that quite shortly we'll be able to engage in part two, and I look forward to that. I'm Jacob, thank you for listening, and have a wonderful day.